Now let's go over the hepatitis viruses, of which there are five types. Hepatitis A is often asymptomatic or will present with mild flu-like symptoms, jaundice, and watery diarrhea. The infection is self-limited and does not progress to chronic hepatitis or hepatocellular carcinoma. An HIV vaccine is available for patients with chronic liver disease, especially hepatitis C. Travelers to high-risk countries are those in high-risk communities. Hepatitis E virus is serologically distinct from hepatitis A, but closely resembles HIV in its incubation and clinical presentation. It is self-limited, but can cause fulminant hepatitis in pregnant women, leading to sudden mortality. Hepatitis C is mainly acquired through IV drug use or blood products such as transfusions. It can be sexually transmitted, but not as easily as hepatitis B. Persistent hepatitis C infections may progress to chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis B has a more complicated virus. After infecting hosts, the partial double-stranded DNA genome is completed by a viral DNA polymerase that creates a fully double-stranded genome. The host cell's RNA polymerase then transcribes viral DNA into viral mRNA. This viral mRNA is used to make viral proteins and to regenerate the partial double-strand DNA virus genome. The partial double-stranded DNA genome is reconstructed using the virus's reverse transcriptase. HPV is transmitted through blood transfusions, sexual contact, and placentally, one of the torches. Acute infection results in jaundice and fever. Chronic infection may result in an asymptomatic carrier state, but there is risk of developing cirrhosis and or hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis D virus is a defective virus that requires hepatitis B surface antigen in order to infect. Transmission of HDV can occur via simultaneous infection with hepatitis B virus, known as co-infection, or via superinfection, which is when hepatitis D virus infects an individual who was previously infected with hepatitis B. Diagnosing hepatitis B involves being able to interpret serologic results that detect the presence of hepatitis B antigens or antibodies produced by the host. Let's review some of the serologic markers we will encounter. For hepatitis A, the presence of anti-hepatitis A virus antibody can tell us whether the patient has acute hepatitis A or was previously infected with hepatitis A. Anti-hepatitis A virus antibody, IgM, is the best test to indicate if a patient has active hepatitis A. Anti-hepatitis A virus IgG antibody indicates that the patient had a hepatitis A infection and will protect this patient from being reinfected in the future. As you may recall from the immunology chapter, IgM antibodies are the first class of antibodies to be produced by the body and indicate acute infections. IgG antibodies are made later after class switching, so their presence indicates chronic or previous infection. Therefore, as a rule of thumb, remember IgM equals acute, while IgG equals chronic or a previous infection. Now let's move on to the markers for hepatitis B. Hepatitis B antigen is the surface antigen found on hepatitis B virus. If you see hepatitis B surface antigen in a patient's blood, this indicates that the patient has a hepatitis B infection. If you were to see that the patient had antibodies against the hepatitis B surface antigen, then the patient has immunity against hepatitis B. This can occur in one of two ways. Either the patient was vaccinated against hepatitis B with the anti-hepatitis B surface antigen antibodies, or the host formed antibodies against the hepatitis B surface antigen and recovered from the infection. The hepatitis B core antigen is an antigen found inside the core of the hepatitis B virus. Antibodies against the hepatitis B core antigen tell you whether the patient has an acute or chronic infection. What type of antibody would indicate a recent HBV infection? Right, as we already discussed, the presence of anti-hepatitis B core antigen IgM antibodies would indicate an acute infection. IgG antibodies, on the other hand, would indicate a chronic infection. Sometimes the only serological marker you might see in a patient's blood is anti-hepatitis B core antigen, and this indicates the patient is in the window period of disease, which we will discuss next. Finally, hepatitis B E antigen is another antigen found in the core of the hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis B E antigen correlates with how infective a person is. 
If the patient has this antigen in their system, the virus is highly transmissible to others. The presence of antibodies against hepatitis B E antigen indicates low transmissibility. Okay, so let's try to put this together. Take a look at the graph here showing the timeline for when certain serological markers will develop in the blood. The main thing you should know is that around the time of five to six months after exposure, there exists a window period where a host has been infected by hepatitis B virus and is successful at clearing the virus. However, the host has not yet begun forming the anti-hepatitis B surface antibodies against the disease, so that the only serological evidence for HBV is the presence of hepatitis B core antigen antibodies. This is the only time when a person infected with hepatitis B virus will not show hepatitis B surface antigen in their blood. So let's go through the next table which tells us which serological markers to expect depending on what type of HPV infection a patient has. Start with a patient who has acute hepatitis B virus. What serological markers would you expect? Well, they have the infection, so they must show hepatitis B surface antigen in their blood. The infection is acute, so which antibodies will they have? IgM hepatitis B core antigen antibodies. Since the infection is acute, we'll expect the host to be highly infected, since he or she hasn't had time to develop antibodies against hepatitis B E antigen. Therefore, you will also see the hepatitis B E antigen. Go through each of the scenarios here and see if you can predict which serological markers will be present. Remember that in the window period, you will only see anti-hepatitis B core antibody. However, someone who recovered from the infection themselves will show evidence that they at one point had the infection with the presence of IgG hepatitis B core antibodies and anti-hepatitis B E antigen antibodies. Let's move on to our final RNA virus, HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. The genome of HIV consists of two identical subunits of single-stranded RNA surrounded by a capsid and enclosed by plasma membrane of the original host cell formed when the caspid buds from the host cell. There are some viral proteins you should know. P24 is a protein found within the capsid. Autovalope proteins include GP120 and GP41. GP120 forms the initial attachment to T cells by binding to CD4 receptors. GP41 then acts to fuse the virus with the host cell and facilitates entry into the T cell. It might help you to remember that the protein with A4 helps the virus get through the door and into the cell. The HIV genome is very complex and has three important genes coding for structural proteins. The ENV gene encodes for GP120 and GP41. The GAG gene codes for the P24 capsid protein, and the POL gene codes for the reverse transcriptase, which will go on to synthesize double-stranded DNA from RNA. Transmission of HIV can occur through sexual contact, blood transfusions, IV drug use, and contact with other bodily fluids such as plasma and CSF. HIV is also transmitted through the placenta and breast milk. HIV primarily infects macrophages and CD4 T cells. Infection and replication of HIV within macrophages is key to HIV's ability to spread to other tissues. HIV also uses chemokine receptors, CXCR4 and CCR5, as co-receptors to help it enter target cells. HIV binds CXCR4 in order to enter T cells, while binding CCR5 helps the virus to enter macrophages. There is a population of patients who have inherited a mutation resulting in genetic deletion of the CCR5 mutation. The patients who are homozygous carriers of this mutation are effectively resistant to HIV infections. Heterozygote carriers will have a slower, milder course of the infection. Diagnosing HIV begins with the initial screening using ELISA test to detect presence of HIV antigens P24, P17, GP120, or GP41. ELISA is very sensitive but not very specific, so it is a useful screening tool, but needs to be confirmed with a highly specific Western blot. HIV infection is confirmed if antibodies to at least two HIV antigens are positive. PCR of HIV DNA is used to determine the patient's viral load and monitor efficacy of treatment. 
It's also used to screen for HIV infection in newborns of HIV-positive mothers since there is a high false positive rate in these babies due to antibodies crossing the placenta. The CD4 T-cell count is also assessed to monitor treatment progress. When CD4 count dips below 200, the diagnosis of AIDS is given. AIDS diagnosis may also be given for those HIV patients who develop an AIDS-defining infection, which we will cover soon, or who have a CD4 to CD8 ratio less than 1.5. The typical course of HIV-infected individuals is as follows. During the primary infection or acute HIV syndrome, patients will experience mono-like symptoms which will occur four to eight weeks after initial infection. Symptoms include fever, generalized lymphadenopathy, malaise, headache, and myalgia. Next is the clinical latency stage. During this period, CD4 cell count makes a rebound and most acute symptoms subside. However, the virus is actively replicating in lymph nodes during this apparently benign stage. Eventually, CD4 T cells will begin to decline several months after initial infection. As CD4 T cells continue to decline, the patient may experience a variety of constitutional symptoms such as weight loss, fever, chronic diarrhea, in addition to a myriad of opportunistic infections and diseases. The opportunistic infections and diseases of AIDS can affect practically any organ system in the body. A systemic infection that can affect HIV-positive adults is histoplasmosis, which can be seen when CD4 counts dip below 100. Dermatologic infections are common. Look for Canada infections causing oral thrush when CD4 counts are below 400 and esophageal thrush when CD4 counts dip below 100. The GI system can become susceptible to diarrhea from cryptosporidium when CD4 counts are below 200. Look for severe chronic watery diarrhea. The neurologic system can be infected with diseases as well. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy caused by the JC virus can be reactivated from its latent form when CD4 counts are less than 200. Toxoplasmosis can cause ring-enhancing lesions within the brain when CD4 counts are less than 100. Meningitis due to cryptococcus may develop, but only at very low CD4 counts, less than 50. Retinitis in the form of cotton wool spots on fundoscopic exam can be caused by CMV infections at CD4 counts less than 50. Finally, HIV-associated dementia can commonly develop and you should suspect this first over the other forms of mental diseases as a cause of neurologic symptoms. There are a few oncologic diseases caused by HIV which aren't strictly confined to specific CD4 counts definitely look out for HHV8 causing Kaposi's sarcoma. And remember that its appearance can easily be confused for Bartonella hensleyi. A biopsy confirms the results. Hairy leukoplakia, an adherent white patch that can develop on the lateral side of the tongue, is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, also associated with EBV, can also develop. Squamous cell carcinoma, found in the anus of men who have sex with men, or in the cervix in women, is caused by HPV. Finally, primary CNS lymphoma is often also associated with EBV. Make sure you distinguish it from toxoplasmosis, which can have the same ring-enhancing sort of appearance on imaging. Finally, the lungs may be affected by HIV. Interstitial pneumonias are caused by CMV, invasive aspergillosis by aspergillus, pneumonia by pneumocystis gyrovecchi, and tuberculosis like disease by Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. Pneumonia caused by pneumocystis gyrovecchi and tuberculosis like disease caused by MAI are important to remember. Pneumocystis occurs as CD4 counts less than 200, and remember to give TMP SMX for prophylaxis. MAI occurs at CD4 counts less than 50, and give azithromycin for prophylaxis. Prion diseases such as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies are a group of rare, fatal brain diseases that can affect animals and humans. Prion is an abbreviation for Proteinaceous Infectious Particle, or PRP. According to early studies, the protein thought responsible for transmissible spongiform encephalopathies did not differ in amino acid sequence from that of a normal cell membrane in the CNS. This led to the hypothesis that this protein exists in two alternative structural forms. The first cellular type contains approximately 40% of alpha helix and only 3% beta pleated sheet and is termed PRPC. 
The second pathogenic variation is known as PRPSC, which contains a higher proportion of beta pleated sheet and less alpha helix. Therefore, it has been proposed that the beta pleated prion is an infectious abnormally folded protein, which can induce normally folded proteins to also adopt the pathogenic form. Prion diseases cause Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, the human disease related to mad cow disease, Gerstmann Strassler Schenker syndrome, and Kuru. These diseases cause impaired brain function, memory changes, alterations of personalities, and movement abnormalities.